morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for coming out this morning. This is our casual selectmen's event. Since there is no opposition, we're going to have a very civilized discussion with our selectmen. And um, I'm going to read you a couple of rules before we get started. First of all, this one is the police commission debate. Please come to this on October 19th, 1030, same location. That will be um, hosted and debate with a real debate moderator, not me, uh, Jean Rabinow. So that will be a debate. Please attend if you can. There are guides. Um, our town back there. There are a bunch of league publications back there if you're interested in knowing stuff about the town or the league. It's all on the back table back there. What we're going to do this morning is we're going to give each of the selectmen 10 minutes. You don't have to take your full 10 minutes, no pressure. But uh, we're going to basically, what we want to do here, one of the goals that we have here and one of the concerns we have as a league is the fact that we do not have a local Weston newspaper anymore. And so it's very, it's a challenge, and we're not the only local towns going through that. It's a challenge, though, to get information. Print newspaper. Print newspaper, excuse me. Sorry, Ted. Did not mean to uh, disparage. Um, <laughs> but because we, not, it doesn't get delivered to your house, to your door, every person in town, um, it's a different, different world that we live in now. So it's more, it's more of a challenge to get information than it has been in the past. And so that challenge is one that I would like you all to, do, to address. What are ways that we can reach our community and get them information, not just about what's going on with the sports teams, not going, what's going on in our meetings, P and Z meetings, building commission, what are those meetings and what, what's going on with a lot of the stuff in the town that not everybody goes to or has access to that information. So that would be one thing that I would like you to discuss, as well as where you see the town going forward, what's, what are the challenges that we have so that we can sort of get an idea of what's new and old in Weston and where we are. So I'm going to give you each 10 minutes. I will time you. Um, if you don't take your 10 minutes, that's fine, too. And after that, we're going to open the floor for questions. At the, at the microphone. At the microphone, right. You do have to go to the microphone as and speak up. And I also really want to emphasize that let's be civilized here. No personal attacks, um, state of the issues, stay in town. This is about the town. You can probably bring up the state, but I would try to stay off the national scene right now, as I think we all want a, a break from that. I certainly do. So with that in mind, who would like to start? Mr. Spaulding? Sure. Uh, and I, I will, uh, first of all, thank you, League, for hosting this. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. I think it's a, a great idea with an uncontested election that we do get to have this conversation. Um, speak up is great, but you know we're a small part of that. And as selectmen, we do have sort of a fairly broad scope of, of work we do and, and do impact, you know, all those other people we sit up on stage with. So, you know, being able to have sort of our ability to give you a longer, more in-depth sort of update about our thinking about specific issues and broader issues and having a sort of, and I hope this is more of a dialogue than sort of people getting up and making statements and us nodding or deflecting, um, you know, because I, I love to hear input and anybody who's visited me knows I take a lot of that in. We try it and, you know, where possible implement it. So, so that said, um, thank you all. In terms of the media, um, there has been an ongoing challenge, but it's been going on, I think, you know, for, for over a decade. So as we all recall, for those of us who have been here, you know, over 15 years, the paper used to come to everyone's door for free. Um, then uh, several years, uh, like probably 10 years ago, they switched to a pay model and it was, you know, it was not cheap and a lot of people stopped getting it. And, you know, I was following, uh, following as closely I could the sort of subscription metrics, who was getting it, how they were getting it. But that, 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 uh, population was shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. Um, then, you know, there was that final transition to sort of three towns where we got to read about Reading sports every week and kind of phased into who knows what that was. And then, you know, we were seeing everybody else's political letters and, it, you know, I could see why they tried it, but um, wasn't really a, a functioning newspaper at that point. Simultaneously, we've had this big burgeoning of sort of the digital social media age and that 
has its blessings and, it, and its pitfalls, um, but we have to deal with the consequences of that. So from our perspective, we, are, we were looking at, and everybody calls me and says, oh, why don't you just start a town paper? Well, if I started a town newspaper, that would basically be propaganda. I mean, that would be, you know, it would be the town's newspaper. It's, we, we're not the Soviet Union. We, we don't do that. Um, I have reached out to other physical paper uh, newspapers, uh, particularly the Hearst Media Group, Norwalk Hour, and, um, and Westport News. In fact, when we first lost our digital newspaper, we immediately had to scramble and find out where we could notice things like planning and zoning, selectmen when you post meetings um, or public hearings. That has to be on record in print due to, due to the existing statute. And we went to the Hearst Group and they said, well, we're looking at you and your paper of record is the Stanford Advocate. Okay, this, that's, this is what, what I started to hit immediately and I'm like, what do you mean, paper of record, Stanford Advocate? Well, those are the, we, we see you have some circulation. They don't even sell it at Peter's. What are you talking about? So they kept, these were the advertising salespeople that were telling me this. So I ended up, you know, climbing up there, uh, navigating through their, through their structure. I reached the vice president of Hearst Group, who was in charge, president of Connecticut Group. I said, that's not going to work for us. If I post something in there, you know, a, a noticed meeting and somebody doesn't see that and there's a meeting about it and they have an interest in it and they decide to sue. I don't have a defense when they say, hey, there's no substantial um, readership of this because we'd lose, that's not okay. So they said, okay, you can post in the Norwalk out. Okay, so that's what we're using for postings. Uh, Westport News has been coming up and, 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 you know, selectively responding to some of our meetings. They, they've been doing more and more, but again, they're not here all the time. Um, in fairness, though, Western Forum kind of almost stopped coming for some things, although there's some representatives that were always there. Um, West Western today uh, is a different mode, a different model of, of media, but I've given them full access. I understand they have an extremely wide scope. Um, but these are all pieces, and they, they, they are all reaching different people. So I'm fully aware that the demographic that was getting Western Forum are not the people who are like on Instagram and Snapchat and Facebook. We just know that. Um, we've tried to look at different ways, like we've discussed with Wendy at the Senior Center about maybe printing up some of the digital stuff and handing it out in paper. Um, we're still gauging the interest in that, things like that. To that end, there's also stuff we're doing as a town to push out communications, and I'm going to hold back a little bit of that because Selectman Nestor is driving the effort to basically launch a new website that's going to have all sorts of Modif well, I'll let you step into that, but all sorts of modified communication preferences. The other things I've done is ask uh, more meetings to be recorded and, and, and broadcast. So right now, as opposed to the prior to last year, uh, we're now recording Board of Finance and we're trying to get um, other meetings up, but there's a financial issue there. Every meeting is something like $150, $200 to do. A lot of meetings nobody attends nor watches. Um, or more, um, depending on how long the meetings last. So, you know, it, it's hard to sit, have a blanket statement, let's record and put up everything. We also know that the viewership on Vimeo and, and, and when we post these things up there is not great anyway. So you, you want to balance taxpayer being fiduciarily responsible with taxpayer money and, you know, making sure the information's out there. Now, if there's things we know that will ra rise to prominence, we will, you know, broadcast those, like some special planning and zoning meetings and things like that. But we don't want to be picking and choosing what we're going to broadcast or not, because then people can accuse us of rightfully picking and choosing what's broadcast or not. So we try and come up with blanket policies. Um, that said, we're doing everything possible, and I'm going to actually turn it back to you folk, too. Any suggestions you have, aside from starting a town newspaper, because it's just something conceptually I think it, it, I'm uncomfortable with, um, we're willing to listen to. I've reached out to all the local newspapers, all that, and we're doing what we can. In terms of what we're doing in town, it kind of still stems back to sort of that first meeting we had right after we formed, and, uh, you know, Samantha Selectman Nestor um, also sort of is on board with philosophy where we talked to a lot of people during that election cycle. I think I talked to something like 1,400 people on the fight, you know, other, just by knocking on doors and calling. But, you know, I also talked to other people through other means. And we heard a lot about the issues. And you can imagine what the issues are. I mean, they were obviously 
They were taxes, they were home values, which you know, are, are, are in a challenging state, but it looked like they're, they're plateauing now. Um, and then there was a lot of people who like stuff. They want stuff, they want amenities. They're not, they're not seeing their friends, they don't have anything to do. Um, there was a lot of concern about, you know, there's nothing in town in terms of, of the downtown center. So understanding sort of how all that was sort of fitting together, we decided to get some more data because that, that was a selective group of people who I actually you know, reached out to and talked to and I know it wasn't representing the whole town. So when, the, when planning and zoning was gonna go forward with their plan of conservation and development, one thing they generally do is do some kind of survey. We said, hey, let's to get together with you and get some information for us too. Let's find out the stuff that, that the town prioritizes because we're making budget decisions. We got, there's a fixed pool of money, you know, it's not infinite, and we need to decide to allocate money here instead of there or otherwise, or what other ways to, re, to get money. And I'm gonna sort of divert back to that in a second, because that's another push we had is finding alternate financing sources, because we understand we don't have a commercial tax base and all that. So we went out and did the survey, and we looked at what people actually wanted in town, and we got an unbelievable response rate. It was close to house, half, half the households. Um, my loan and McBroom, the people who worked with us in the Planet Conservation Development, were astounded by that number. That was an unbelievable level of citizen engagement, and it says something great about Weston. The other thing it does is give us a whole lot of information about what people actually want, don't want, and value, and we tried to incorporate that thing, th those facts in there. So we heard, you know, not that we didn't know, but like the roads are a problem, and you, you, I'm bringing that up, and I know it, there's, there's criticism there. Um, we actually went from a year and a half ago, we were spending 440,000 to this year spending 960,000, and the roads are still rough. I, I, you know, it's good news is right now they just started the milling. So those milling for the roads we're actually gonna take care of are starting this week. But we understand the roads are a problem, so what we also did was we hired a series of engineer, an engineering firm to look at every single road because we had the same DPW director for the last four years and he had an old school way of doing it and we needed a sort of more modern, more empirical way of doing it. So we're now gonna factor that into the next round of that. But we also understand our police fire EMS facilities in problematic shape and you heard for the last decade about different plans. We came up with a plan that was really streamlined, it really targeted the key liabilities that we had in there. That means legal issues, if something went wrong, what do we have to fix because of codes and other issues. We came up with a plan, we got buy-in from all the stakeholders, um, we got potentially some donor money that hopefully comes through and uh, we need to move on that because our communication infrastructure is a problem. Uh, you know, that last huge lightning storm knocked out our communications and we had to go to backup radios. Backup radios are fantastic, so no one was in jeopardy, but I don't want to see that again. Another storm, I was in there during the storm. Officer Budaki had to drive me to town. The generator had blown server room because there was no air conditioning, it was overheating, we almost lost all communication. Not acceptable, not safe, I won't let that happen to you. Chris? Close. Your, your 10 minutes are almost up, so, <laughs> so you can wrap it up, so, feel free. So what I'll wrap up, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and I can go on forever, and, uh, you know, <laughs> and I do, <laughs> and I know that, but I, you know, I tend to be a little pedantic, um, didactic. Um, so going forward, what we want to do is continue sort of driving with these key issues, uh, supporting infrastructure, building community, building amenities, finding streamlined ways to do finances. We did that, we got four and a half million dollars potential savings over the next 25 years with virtual net metering deal, which is green energy coming to us. We're gonna save a lot of money for that. We've got about four plus million dollars in expected grants from sidewalks we got from state and, and uh, federal funds. Um, we, we are back, we just, the board just approved a second bond refunding. So like when you refinance your house, the town does that. Last year we saved 250,000, we're doing another 250,000. We're cutting where we can. We actually had the last two years a decline in full-time employees on the town side. We're gonna to continue to look at ways to streamline and optimize, and we've been doing it. We'll have some more announcements coming in this budget season will certainly be the discussion. So that said, moving forward, we're gonna to continue to listen to you and continue to work on these key issues. Okay, thank you very much. Selectman Rosener. <laughs> thank you. I'll go second, third, okay? That's, you know, we'll, we'll mix it up, Republican, Democrat, Republican, try to be fair. Select. It is the league. We don't differ. Select, excuse me, select people. 
Um, go ahead. Sam. Thanks. So I, I want to thank the league as well for having having us here. Um, obviously, with the with the uh, lack of a uh, paper and also the lack of a contested election, these things are all, all the more important. So uh, thank you very much. Um, I want to take kind of a ten thousand foot view of our role as selectmen uh, as it relates to uh, to Weston. Obviously, um, as Chris mentioned, when we were first elected with Brian, we, we all got together before we were sworn in and talked about what we wanted to accomplish. Uh, and there was a definite common denominator among all three of us and all the ideas that we, uh, that we presented to each other. Uh, and that was to create a, uh, a flourishing community in Weston, uh, the sort of place where everybody is supported, everybody can be their best. Uh, weaknesses are buttressed and strengths are celebrated. And uh, Weston, in that respect, is very, very strong today. We have uh, great examples of it. Lachat Farm is an absolute triumph. Uh, the Historical Society and their programming is fantastic. Uh, the library is seeing tremendous uh, growth and, uh, and usage. Um, we've, we've had developed our own programs in that regard as well. Uh, Explore Valley Forge and Weston Flea were designed essentially to create, again, a more flourishing, a more vibrant community. Uh, we have some natural advantages, I think, here in Weston in that regard because of our size. Um, one of the perks of being a selectman, in fact, it's probably the only perk of being a selectman I can think of, <laughs> is that we get invited to the graduation ceremony uh, every year at the high school. And, uh, and I can tell you, it's an it's a amazing experience. And I think it comes from the size of our community. You know, if a, if a child enters kindergarten or first grade here in Weston today, uh, they will be with that class of about 150, 160 students year after year until they graduate. And that's a tremendous advantage. You know, they, I'll get into social psychology for a second, a subject close to Chris's heart. You know, the, the social psychologists tell us that a, a community of about 150 is ideal uh, for, for human beings. You know, every animal has kind of a, a ideal uh, size of community. Ours is about 150. And by happenstance, our classes in Western schools are about 150. So as I was saying in these graduation ceremonies, these kids are great. I mean, they are warm. They are supportive of each other. Um, their skills that they, that they bring to that ceremony and to each other are just absolutely fantastic. And that is something, uh, that size class, that sort of warmth that develops is something that Weston has uniquely when you think about it. Not Greenwich, not Stanford, not Richfield, not Wilton, not even Easton Reading uh, has that. We have that. We have great schools and so do they, but we have, we have a small community and that's something that we should be proud of and something that I think we always have to protect and, uh, and, and allow to flourish. Uh, we do face some headwinds, obviously. Uh, when I was chairman, when the last plan of conservation development was, uh, was developed in, uh, in PNZ in 2010, and we looked at, what we did was we uh, counted up all the lots in Weston that were four acres or more and divided by two to figure out just how many lots were left for development. Now that is a number that uh, assumes that they would come up for sale, which they wouldn't necessarily ever do. Assumes that they're all developable, which they aren't necessarily. And we came up with a number of about 300, which means for the rest of eternity, Weston has a, a growth potential of about 10% at best. And in fact, in this new POCD study, we know that since 2010, there's been an average of two homes built in Weston every year. So we know that expenses are going to continue to increase uh, and we know that our revenue is limited. So we have to be extremely creative, unified, limber, uh, to try to address ourselves to that. Um, and you know, I think the, uh, the way that we concluded in the last POCD we should do that is to, like the only thing that makes sense, drive demand for existing housing stock. We can't let go of two acre zoning. We can't stop preserving open space. No reason to save the body if the soul is already gone. We have to continue to drive demand for existing housing stock. And that is rolling back to the idea of a flourishing community. If we have a flourishing community, uh, we will attract people to our, home, to our uh, community uh, to buy homes, to, to increase demand in our homes. Uh, back in the 2010, our POCD concluded that we needed to look at our downtown. Um, you know, most of us don't see it anymore. As we drive into town, our gateway is a bus depot followed by a um, uh, chain link fence uh, fire pond. 
followed by a gas station, and then you're out of it, you know, and, and some Fusithia. We, we can do a little better than that. And, uh, and you know, we, I think we all know where the POCD is going at this point, for the most part. And I think we, in the next two years, uh, I won't speak for all of us, but I, but I hope we can start looking at uh, moving the bus depot, thinking about what other land we want to preserve. How can we continue to be a flourishing community? How can we continue to develop ourselves in that way? Thank you. Okay, you have more time if you'd like. No, that's our best. <laughs> You're good? <Yes>. Okay. <laughs> Samantha, you want to start? You take it. <laughs> <laughs> so first, I want to thank the League of Women Voters as well for hosting this. Um, it's, it's a good opportunity for, for us also as uh, select people um, to, to show sort of what our wheelhouses are and, and where our different areas of expertise are and how we um, as a team actually work together. We were, we were talking a little bit before um, the program began. Um, and what we said was even when the three of us differ on things, uh, what we end up with at the end um, is usually better than what one person thought of from the start. Um, and I also want to say, even though I was not at that planning meeting a couple of years ago, I was with Chris going door to door. And I was with him most of the last election, listening to people and getting their feedback. And prior to this, I was the chair of the Marketing and Communications Committee. So I was um, deeply connected to the actual survey that went out. Um, and we were very interested in the results. Um, and for me, my wheelhouse is really communications. Um, and we have this amazing town um, that has a huge challenge of speaking to people who are very far apart from each other. So even though we are a small town, sometimes we don't get connected as well. So um, it thrilled me to see in our goals, really, that community and connection um, are key elements um, that we need to strengthen um, as, as a town. And uh, that goes beyond um, just posting signs for an event. Um, and it says, you know, uh, our Memorial Day Parade is, is, a, is a big event, and it's the one event of the year where I think I see most of our town. Um, and everyone is interested in, in, in going. And if you're, you know, there are more people marching than there are on the sidelines. Um, so, so when I think of Weston, I think of, I think of that. And I think of Devil's Den and La Chatte and our amazing schools and um, the beautiful environment that we have around us. Um, and again, how do we communicate that to each other? How do we say to each other, you know, this should matter your voice is important, um, and how do we build on um, the small things that we already do? Um, one of the things that we're doing um, as part of the communications program is um, creating a new website that, I, that, is, that is actually user-friendly, that is, is more of a marketing piece to the town, but also a valuable place to get information. Um, as part of that program, we are also adding an opt-in feature that is incredibly secure, um, which means if you go on the website and I see it as, while well, Stefan is 30,000 feet, I'm in the weeds. So just, so, so, that, so that you can see, I want information about every P&Z meeting that comes out. And you will get an email that tells you every info, bit of information on the PNZ meetings that happen. I want to know about the historic district commission meetings for the entire year. You will get the agendas, you will get the updates, you will get reminders. You will also be able to opt in for different programs that you already may be participating in. You may already be on the library list, you might be on the parks and rec list, but all of those lists and all of those things will be housed on a secure server so your personal data will not be, be able to be accessible. It will be protected from hacking. Um, we are understanding that it's a digital age, but we are very cognizant that your personal information should remain personal and, and private. Um, so the other part we're doing, and you've probably seen it, we recognize that not everybody's on social media, but we do think it's important that we have a social media presence. In addition to our social media presence, we do want to be able to have those announcements and those things be printed 
Um, and as part of our goals for, for moving forward, we will have printed things that are available at the Senior Center. I think one of the reasons why our survey worked out so well is because not only did we have digital launching of the survey and people being um, outreach to do the survey through digital means, but they also we also had signage throughout the town, but we also had printed surveys at the Senior Center. So I think it's important for all of us to realize that one solution and one platform isn't going to solve this, that we have to look at it as a whole group um, and as a whole unit and see what we can do to inform each other. Um, and, and the enthusiasm that our citizens and residents have about our different programs, that's the best marketing tool that we have. Um, I look at Lashat, and that is a jewel, but that took time. And I think that what we have to realize is we have things and amenities that are happening that maybe could be the next Lashat, like a town green, like maybe a library extension, um, different, different opportunities that we have that keep Weston true to its values and true to its, its goals, but also show that we move forward, that we think that we, are, we, are, we, we should have a maker space for older kids. Um, I have a seven-year-old and a 12-year-old, and my seven-year-old comes here to the library, but my 12-year-old would love a maker space. So I think it's important that we keep an open mind and that we keep moving forward. Um, I, I do want to say, you know, we, we also want to be able to have amenities, and I'm going to say it like the dog park. We want to have amenities that open things up to a multiple range of people who can access them, that aren't limited to one pocket of the community. And that will build us better and will also make it so people want to move here. Because ultimately, our marketing also has to market to our internal community, but it has to also market to people who are looking to move to Connecticut or looking to move to Fairfield County. And what we found when Chris and I went door to door was that it's not just people moving here who have small children, that people are empty nesters who are moving here because it's so beautiful and moving here because of all the wonderful things that Weston has to offer. So as part of our charge, we are creating a real estate publication that will go to all the brokers that really showcase the best of what Weston has. So that when people are looking to move here, they understand, wow, you know, Westport, what did they call, they called it in the newspaper, global, small town globalism or whatever. If they can be the small town globalists, I think that we could be the eco chic people. <laughs> um, so I, th that being said, um, None of this can happen uh, in a vacuum. And we've had amazing volunteers who have stepped up and put in their time to, to design a town green and do a big party around the founding of Weston. We've had volunteers come up and design a new logo and uh, do video and interviews for the marketing. We've had um, volunteers come up and they do step up. They do all of the social media posting for the town of Weston in addition to Randy, our administrator. So I also want to acknowledge that there are people who are not getting paid, who are not, you know, who have their full-time jobs, who are stepping in and saying, this is an amazing place and we want more people to know about it. And the more people who know about it, the more people can step up, like Stefan said, and purchase these homes that are available, and we can have a thriving community. And we have enough things that are happening here and the potential of what's happening in the future to really be a forward-thinking community that is very aware about conserving of what it has. Okay, pretty close, very good. <laughs> okay, I'm- Under? Perfect. I know, oh. right? <laughs> yes, you said it yourself. 30,000 feet in the weeds. <laughs> this oatmeal just like you guys covered all the things. <laughs> uh, okay. This is 
collaboration. <laughs> okay. All right. So now um, it's up to you, the audience, to ask your questions of the selectmen. And I ask that you go up to the microphone and, as we do in Speak Up, um, state where you live and all that kind of stuff. And I also realize that many of these people in the room probably don't know who I am. <laughs> I'm Laura Smits from the League of Women Voters, of, formerly of Weston, now of Norwalk, but also of state. Um, I was in this town for over 20 years. So um, it's a great town, and I miss it. I miss it a lot. Margaret, you're going to lead us off? Yes. Uh, Margaret Wurtenberg, uh, Wilson Road. Uh, first of all, I would like to truly thank this Board of Selectmen. Uh, so gracious that you did come and, and offer this. You didn't have to, and, and I appreciate it, and I'm sure everyone else does. People are sort of basically not saying it, but they're crying out for this kind of thing, and I'm, I'm very grateful to you. And I could have asked some questions, because I said, gee, if there's only five people here, somebody has to, I don't think I have to ask too many questions. I think, yeah, you're probably pretty And just pretty thank good. you. I'm going to video the rest of it. <laughs> thank okay. you. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> thank you. Hi, Maria Proto, Seven Roscray. You already, you're smiling. You can, you can read it. Um, I am with the Weston Dog Park, and our nonprofit's getting a lot of questions about what's going on with the dog park. We can't answer that, only you can, so we'd like to know what's going on with the dog park. Um, is the town in support of the dog park? That's another big question we're getting. It's like, how is the town feeling about the dog park on the Moore property? And also, we're getting questions about how much the litigation is costing um, with the Stop the Weston Dog Park people, how much has the town paid so far? Okay, so um, first of all, I'd like to point out that there is litigation on this matter, so what I'm going to have to say is going to be somewhat circumspect. The litigation is not with the selectmen per se, it's with Conservation Commission, but given the Conservation Commission is appointed by the Board of Selectmen and answers to the Board of Selectmen, um, it, it's going to curtail somewhat what I say because we generally don't do a lot of commenting on stuff that's in litigation. That said, um, in terms of a dog park, I think it's a fantastic amenity. I think Weston needs a dog park and, and it's a great thing. In terms of the location, the town has already spoken. There's been a vote on that specific location and and should, should the um, the lawsuit come out in favor of the town, then we will we will abide by the town's will. Um, we have necessarily not been discussing this because of the fact it's still in litigation and the litigation is, is going to go on for the next couple of months. I think they're, they've just submitted briefs and things this, this uh, month. But again, I've stayed somewhat back from it because this has to do with conservation and them and I'm trying not to, to get involved in it. Uh, I just need to be brief top line stuff. In terms of the cost right now, I, and again, this isn't an exact number and I'm doing off top of my head because I didn't bring the numbers, something in the vicinity of $28,000, $29,000 we spent so far. Uh, defending uh, this specific uh, piece of litigation at this point in just legal fees. So I ho hope that covers it. I don't know if you guys want to join in. or. Yeah, I'm, I guess I'm kind of an outlier on the Board of Selectmen on this issue. I, I too, however, am uh, wholly in favor of a dog park. Um, I think the more amenities we can have in town, the better, and that seems like one that has a tremendous amount of support. Uh, I am not supportive of the location that was chosen. Um, and. Uh, uh, I think for a number of reasons. Number one is on the Moore property. That is a late succession forest. It's beautiful. It's the tip of a, uh, a very large piece of open space. It's not legally conserved, but it is uh, very valuable open space. Uh, to use it as a dog park requires the building of an eighth of a mile of roadway. Uh, I think over a dozen, close to two dozen uh, parking spaces and a turnaround. Um, one of the principles of zoning is that you try to centralize and, uh, and multi-purpose facilities, use existing facilities to the extent that you can. Uh, I have very informally in the town suggested that uh, the location be moved potentially to Pasegli. Um, that is uh, not forest at all. It's, uh, it's very early succession woods and isn't going anywhere fast. Uh, we could put the, uh, put the dog park there and we could utilize existing uh, roadways, existing parking, um, I'm also concerned that a dog park in the Moore property, that is a wooded lot. 
And uh, I've been looking around at dog parks in the, in the area and in, uh, in where we have our summer home in Massachusetts. Uh, I haven't yet seen a dog park in a wooded lot. I think that might become uh, uh, untenable. Uh, I think it's probably going to be a mess uh, with the leaves. Uh, then there's horsefly and INAT season. Um, and I, I'm concerned that it will not be, ultimately will not be used uh, in the season that we expect it to be used. Um, so uh, again, I, I want to say clearly, I am in full support of a dog park, but I'd like to see it moved uh, to another location and, uh, and, and work started as quickly as possible. Uh, and, I, and I also have to comment on the litigation expense you know, I don't want to. I don't want to imply, uh, because we're talking about the uh, expense of litigation that the uh, the neighbors of this uh, uh, of the Moore property have put us through, that they somehow are doing something bad. They're hoping to protect their homes, their home values, and their neighborhood. Uh, and I don't think we uh, should uh, imply that they're not rolling over fast enough when we ask to put a dog park in that area. So, you know, uh, litigation is the price of development, I think, and, uh, and we should anticipate it. Okay, I just Thank need you. to follow up because first, <clears throat> I've been asked about the litigation. I don't have the answers, that's why I asked you. People are asking me. Second, I just, for the record, Bisegli has already been looked at by the previous board with um, Brian. Um, it has been examined along with every other piece of property, and for many reasons, it was declined. Um, and I think that it's important. I don't. I think putting it out there over and over, Bisegli, because of the wetlands, because of the size of the property back there, it has been discussed by the town over and over, and I think that needs to go out there because I don't think that was a fair statement. Um, and that's. I just wanted to add that. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I would agree that that uh, that all the properties were looked at. What I'm suggesting is that they weren't looked at uh, comprehensively and properly. Okay. Good morning. My name is Woody Bliss. I live at, on uh, Grace Farm Road. Uh, I'm interested in uh, the uh, Town Green project that uh, Samantha mentioned, and I'd be interested in the status of it and where you guys uh, stand on the, the Town Green. I love anything that builds community that's an amenity. Uh, having work, ha working in a town hall as you did, um, you see people walking through all day long. Um, Selfishly, from a staff perspective, it would be nice for them to be able to just sit outside and eat at a bench. Um, I see kids coming from the fields, walking across, going to the library. I see parents waiting for them. I see kids and adults, and I would like to see seniors walking through there, finding it to be a gathering place, maybe have lunch on a bench there. Um, and it looked like the programming that, that, that the committee is designing is going to be something that's going to bring the town together. Uh, I'm very excited for Founders Day. I actually got a uh, tricorn hat, so I'll be wearing that and I'll debut that for everybody. Um, October 11th yeah. is the pitch. 4:30, um, 6:30. The status of it is uh, so right now. It's going to so the idea is going to be debuted when I'll let select like Nestor take over in a second because she's actually on the committee. Um, we did as a board a uh, couple nights ago uh, make decisions about moving forward with with. Uh, so, you know, uh, creating or not directly through the town, but uh, supporting the idea of the creation of a 501c to sort of uh, lead the way in terms of help, helping gather money up for that. Um, that said, you know, funding's coming from various sources and some of it's guaranteed, some of it's not, and let's hope it all pans out. Okay, so, so <laughs> everyone to understand the town green, We've been really fortunate that the beautification committee designed, um, had Thiel Architecture Plus Design uh, pro bono create this amazing design for the town green. Um, and that town green, uh, we also see as connecting for the library, town hall, the renovated onion barn, uh -huh. you know, town center, all of these things that come together as a nexus. Um, so that, you know, while there are things happening in Lachat, which is further uptown, we really have something that's local here. Um, and uh, I, I just want to say one thing about the talent in this town. People don't realize, but the people who designed this space, they came from the biggest architects 
known. Rockwell Group, Michael Graves, Annabelle Seldorf, the group of people that they studied with before they, Bob Stern, before they came here. What, the architect who did it designed downtown Disney, and we get to have her design our town green. Like, that's amazing, for free. So there's these wonderful opportunities. So, so Woody, I 100% support the town green. Uh, we have been uh, really excited and the marketing committee has been involved with Founders Day as a way to kick off uh, the founding of, and, and for people who don't know, when they were doing the research for the town green, they found a book that finally said the actual date of the founding of Weston. Before that, we never knew. So that is why this kickoff is really the launch of the fundraising and the launch of what will hopefully be an annual event. And um, I, think, I think there's going to be um, uh, a town selfie. You know, every, every year the idea is that we'll do something that's emblematic of that year that we'll be, we'll be talking about the history but also focusing on something for, going forward and we will have everybody gather on the steps of Town Hall and there'll be a big aerial photograph of everybody jumping. I think there'll be an aerial, uh, an aerial photograph. Okay, aerial photograph of everyone jumping. I'm going to check with Ira if we can jump. Okay, no, no jumping, no jumping. I don't but, want that. <laughs> but I think it's 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 something again that crosses <laughs> generations. And uh, when when this was before the historic commission, uh, one of the members of the board of Ed education, she said, we we always, we can't just think of things in terms of history. We also have to think of terms of of these programs in terms of the future, and think of how it will be used in the future. And that's what this is. This is a forward-looking uh, program, architectural creation, landscape design, that will be for the future generations. And it will not even be thought about. It will not even be, wait, there was a time when there was no town green? And that's what we have to think about is, how will our, our kids remember it? How will their kids remember it? And I think it's an amazing thing. Did I answer your question? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Stefan, do you have anything to add? Or? Uh, very briefly, yeah. Just to amplify what Chris and Samantha said, I, I'm in full support of it. I think, uh, you know, rolling back to my opening comments, we want to uh, establish community in a, in a uh, correct environment for community. That means programming, but it also means facilities. So interconnected sidewalks, um, having a space uh, in front of town hall for people to gather, uh, have kind of a center, uh, is all that kind of geographic community building that I think is important. Suffice right, it well, to say, I support anything that involves potentially bringing food trucks in. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I think it's a great amenity for uh, Weston. And the other thing I like is uh, it will focus some recognition on those residents of Weston who've served in the armed forces and not come back. They gave their lives uh, in support of the country. That would That's in the town green plan as opposed to off in the corner of uh, the town hall lot. So I, I it will, thank you for your it support. We'll augment the, the, the memorialization and the recognition of those folks, and that is a great aspect. And thank you for pointing that out. It's critical, I think. Okay, thank you. Next. Uh, Dave Muller, Weston Road. Um, many, we are required um, to have many of the town's major decisions decided by a town meeting. Um, and we all know from experience that you can have a town meeting and you look around and wonder if there's anyone in town because so few people appear. If it's contentious enough, you do get a number of people. I'm curious on you, about your opinion on whether the town meeting, um, the regular town meeting and the annual town budget meeting is still the most appropriate and most efficient way for the town to make uh, to finalize decisions. Huh. I, I love the, the regular town meeting and, and some of that is because of sort of throwback core sort of Yankee sensibility and having groups like this get together and discuss stuff one-on-one. -on -one. And, and we are getting more and more turnout for a lot of issues where we're having it. So engagement is up. And there, there was a period of lull, but that is up. Um, if we could augment that with digital, so we're looking at ways to put screens up and we can have people at home who are calling into that, that's even better. Because my concern with the town meeting is necessarily frequently they happen where they disenfranchise one group or another. Like right now, this meeting, anybody who's got kids in a sports team, they just can't make it. Uh, ATBM, 
uh, starts pretty late in the evening, and a lot of people with families, especially with young kids, that you know need to get homework and stuff done. You know, so I'd like to see a hybridization of that over time, where we could have sort of people participate remotely, but still have it valid and count. Um, with regard to the ATBM and the referendum, I'm, we all know it's sort of a, a complicated hybridization um, with sort of weird incentives, whether to show up or not. Um, we, we haven't had a quorum in many years. Um, I understand how we got there through the Charter Revision Committee to do this sort of make sure we keep the ATBM so that we can have that discussion, but the only thing you can do in the ATBM is lower the budget, so you could think that anybody who supports the budget or thinks it's too low, why would they bother showing up? Because you're only given the option for one side of the thing, and then we have the referendum after anyway. So I think it's a complicated issue. <coughs> I do think it should be <coughs> revisited which way to go. And then people will say, well, because you have the referendum, nobody's coming to the ATBM. I don't know that. I don't know that's not just changing times and have people that have different ways to do it, but I do think it's something um, that's worth thinking about going forward. Um, I don't know if that answers it, because I don't think there are any real answers. Oh, I, was gonna, I don't We're know if there's a perfect best. answer. Right. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting question. Um, it, it has, it's come to my attention, uh, now that I'm on the Board of Selectmen, even more so, that uh, the town meeting is, it's a flawed way of doing business. You know, essentially any special interest group can come in and attend a town meeting and, and get what they want. The good news is, is, you know, I see a lot of familiar faces here. The same 30 people are making the decisions for about 10,000 residents. Take that as good news or bad news. Um, you know, we, we could, the technology exists, I suppose, that we could have uh, polling in every household for every issue, but I'm not sure that would be any better. I think that that would be asking people to essentially make a decision with, uh, you know, the five minutes that they want to uh, dedicate to it. So I think the bottom line is it's a flawed system, but it's probably the best of the available systems. Um, and it's a, it's a historical uh, New England uh, system, so have some, uh, have some uh, sentimental attachment to it anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Ray Rout. I live at 254 Georgetown Road. Lived there for 30 some odd years. Uh, as many of you know, I've been involved in active transportation in the town, the area, and the state uh, for decades, actually. Weston has, on its east side, something called the Saugatuck Trail. It runs along the reservoir, starts in Huntington State Parks, and run down, runs down to the dam. On the west side of Weston, we have something called the Norwalk River Valley Trail, which essentially runs along the Norwalk River Valley from uh, Danbury to Norwalk. So my proposal, and I've uh, talked to many people about this over the last six years or so, is to develop a walking trail that goes from the Saugatuck Trail on the reservoir to the uh, Norwalk River Valley Trail. Um, most of the pieces of that I've already put together. Uh, we go through the den, we go through, um, through the Fromson property, we go through properties in uh, Wilton that are part of open space. Um, and I'm curious because I'll be talking to David Brandt uh, next week, who's chairman of the Aspect Land Trust. I'm very curious, is the town of Weston going to support this effort? Absolutely. So, and I have the same hope and um, I can guess what my colleagues are going to say, but, um, and we did, we've actually uh, applied for some grants for other walking trails. Uh, they were not supported, but we do have some sidewalk stuff going on and I actually have some ideas about bike lanes and stuff too. But that said, with this specific trail you're talking about, I, I, I'm not sure if you're aware or not, but we, we have been working, attempting to work on a deal where we get potential state funding for the Aspetuck Land Trust to buy up Fromption Strassler. The benefit of that is they would be putting that, that, that spur, that trail in there, and we as Western taxpayers wouldn't necessarily have to pay for that. The problem is basically paying for the stuff. So we already, and if you can get me grants, that's great, or volunteers, or all that. But I am 100% in support of it, should we be able to get funding. I have an amazing number for what this will cost the town of Weston, and for the town of Reading, and the town of uh, Easton, and the town of uh, Wilton. Zero dollars. It's all there. So, so what, do we, what do we have to do? 
I mean, we can take this offline too. Well, we I'm have we have to talk about we have to talk about rooting and that sort of thing. Uh, for example, the rooting across Devil's Den, that's existing trails, which goes into a, a property, Reading Land Trust, uh, just. Well, also, bus. Devil's Den is, is not our property necessarily. It's not your property, but Devil's Den is certainly on board with this okay. with this project. So let's, if you can coordinate, I'm going to certainly okay. be involved in any meeting you want, and I will 100% support it and put the full weight of whatever I can behind helping get it done. Okay. Uh, since that was so brief, let me ask one other question. Uh, well, I, I don't know. Uh, you might want to hear from my A couple of bites well. of the apple here today. I was just chatting with someone on the police commission uh, about the new sidewalks. And uh, she offered to that, that they were going to walk the new sidewalk locations, that sort of thing. Uh, let me just say that you should be multi-use trail, not sidewalks. It should be asphalt, not concrete. Runners like asphalt. They do not like concrete. Uh, we, we, we certainly are considering all modalities of, um, of infrastructure. The issue is in, uh, that we're considering are things like maintenance, uh, longevity, cost, safety. Um, we do have engineers on that, on that um, on that commission also. And if those are public meetings, so if you would like to come and propose, I'm, I'm sure everybody would be happy to listen to your thoughts. And finally, uh, I'd like to thank Stephen for his refreshing briefness in his opening remarks. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, thank Ray. you, Ray. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And try to keep it to one question, just saying so we can get everybody's questions answered. You can always come back for a second round. Go ahead, sir. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Tatum. I live on 19 Hackberry Hill. Um, I understand there was a gift given to the town by um, an artist um, named Daniel Ofoot. He passed away. Um, could you elaborate on what exactly that gift was? Um, so to clarify, the gift has not been given yet. The gift or, uh, is, sorry, the trust. Well, it's potentially committed based on uh, some requirements being fulfilled. And those requirements, first of all, the gift is potentially up to $5 million for an expansion of the library. Some portion of that would go to construction and another portion would go to an endowment to basically uh, help support the funding of it. It is to, at this point, what he wanted to donate was not necessarily the money, but a building. So the gift is an actual structure that he basically thought would be a nice monument to his best friend who lived in town, who loved the town, and uh, wanted the, 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 a representation of him to, to, to memorialize sort of his contribution to town. He's already spent around a million dollars all around town in, in different uh, venues and, and was planning on spending a bunch more. Um, that gift, if it happens, is contingent on us um, getting through all the town approvals that we have to. At the moment, it's gone through planning and zoning, the selectmen. There's been a sense in the meeting approval for the library board. Right now, it's going through the Historic District Commission. Uh, there's a meeting on October 16th, which could be the last meeting to determine the ultimate fate of this project. So if everybody, anybody has an interest one way or another, please show up. This is literally going to be probably the last meeting on this. Um, and, it, and if you think it's something that's important for the town, um, please step up and share your opinion. Uh, the gift is, is a state-of-the-art, uh, no compromises, you know, maker space, including uh, wet space for, you know, doing things like pottery and, and crafts like that, or dirty space, they call it, but it's also going to be a wet space. Uh, you know, an area for just um, creating and playing and tinkering, and then a computer lab with high-end sort of computer-aided designs, as well as some recording studios for podcasts and stuff. Just really type, the type of stuff that's, that will really augment our amazing program at the library now. Um, worked extensively with the library to come up with this plan, and it's now moving through the process. But um, in no way can I say this is a done deal, and you know, again, if you want it to be, please uh, join in and share. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Vicki Thomas. I live on Blueberry Hill, and I might add, on top of Blueberry Hill. Can you sing it, please? Yes, I can uh, <laughs> sing it, yes. So I want to talk about this device. 
Uh, and I'm going to do a run-on sentence so that my things are, there's a two-part to this. The first is, when we talk about communication and having lost the Western Forum and the Western News, I grew up on a farm and we had a party line. And so we knew everybody's business. <laughs> and um, Gail Weinstein, when she was first selectman, it seemed to me she was always coming in on our telephone. And it usually was about a blizzard, a snowstorm, take cover, take shelter, don't be on the roads, all that kind of stuff. I'm, you have our numbers. I'm wondering if that is only used for emergency purposes and couldn't you call us on the phone and let us know highlights of Weston? So, so let me just jump in and then, because right. I gotta explain the current system. Yeah. So the current system is yes, but we, we, we need to use it for emergency, system, emergency purposes for a couple of reasons. One, people opted in to it for emergency notification, not for, hey, we're canceling this meeting, hey, this uh, room is being changed to this, you'd be getting dozens of emails every day. The problem with that would be when there was a true emergency, and we've used it a couple of times for true emergencies. It's not my voice. The reason it's not my voice is because I have a very close relationship uh, with the emergency management team here because I've spent many full days in the emergency operations center. And they are really doing the work, and I wanted them, their voice to be the credit. So Officer Michelli is an amazing gentleman. He has kept you all safe, and you, know, you have no idea how much. Um, he's the one who's, on the, who's the voice of those notifications. So when you hear that, it's not that I don't care. I'm usually sitting next to him when that's happening. It's that I fully believe that he deserves recognition. Um, but we do need to be that to have a potent reminder. So if you're getting one for every storm coming in, and I posted on Facebook and other places that there are storms coming in, but if you're getting emergency notification, you'd stop taking it seriously when you see that it doesn't materialize in what it's supposed to be. And we need that, so when that call comes in and you see that code red, you're like, wow, that is serious, I better act. And we do not want to dilute that. That said, we do have other options. <laughs> and that's what I'm working on. Okay. Um, so the, the idea of the opt-in program, the subscribing program, uh, we wouldn't be a code red, but it would be a code green for sustainability alerts or, you know, a code book for notifications about the library. You can choose how you receive that material. You can be through text messages. It can be through emails. Um, I think still recorded phone calls would probably only be um, uh, for emergencies still, but it would be text message. And once we have that up and running, which we'll launch with our website within the new year, hopefully sooner. But um, uh, the idea is that because everybody has their phones with them, how do you want to receive the information? And that's how you, you'll choose. And if you choose to receive the information by text, you'll get it by text. If you choose by email, you'll get the information and you will be able to carve out exactly what you want to receive information about. Okay, so, so my run-on sentence is, okay. I live on top of Blueberry Hill. When I go down to Blueberry Hill, I have no cell service. I don't have cell service until I, I get, get practically <laughs> to Westport. So I have reached out to all the vendors who supply the towers, which are Verizon, AT&T, et cetera. They need to build the towers. It's not something that the town does and can say, hey, AT&T, come here and do this. We're ordering it. Part of that has to do... And we have gotten a partial commitment, and you are in that dead zone that goes down, basically, uh, lines, yes. planes. We know about that. We have begged them to put a tower at uh, Station 1 or station, station 2? 2. Station 2 on lines, plane, which would be covering you. AT&T gave us a partial, hey, that's not a bad idea. We'll think about it. Then we call them back, and it, it, they won't answer. Um, <laughs> think about it. We have very low density, so... They don't have a whole lot of motivation to, to basically serve us because it's not that many clients. That said, there is a program called First Alert, which, uh, and I'm not going to go into too much detail because I, I see other people waiting behind you, but it's an emergency notification system for first responders, and they got a, a basic contract to do that, but part of that contract is 100% coverage, so at some point, they're going to have to fill that coverage in. I can't guarantee you when it's going to be, but it, I've been talking to all the vendors. I complete, continue to talk to the vendors whenever I can. I know about the dead spot, and I'm, I'm working my best, but we can't build a tower on our own. Those are millions of dollars, and so we're working on it. Well, just remember three, three ways of getting the word out. Use television, telephone, tell a woman. Thank you. And we'll tell you. Thank you very much.
Hi, it's Peter Blau. I'm on Lions Plain Road. Um, recently, there was a report in, by the CCM on comparing mill rate increases uh, across the state. There were some false data in it. Uh, it, included, it mentioned that Weston was, had a 10% increase in mill rate, but it did, didn't uh, account for the uh, decrease in the grand list. So, uh, but uh, my question is two part. One, why didn't the town respond to that report which was in the news and explain what the actual impact was? Because a number of people, I just witnessed a couple of days ago, uh, a home shopper in Wilton who was talking about looking in Wilton and Weston and saying that Weston has attractively low house prices, but they're afraid of the taxes, uh, possibly. So one, why didn't the town you know, try to clear the air on it? And we, two- We did, there was actually a retraction that came about an hour later from CCM on From that. CCM, but it didn't include, it didn't update but, but, but with the, the information about Weston. We didn't the first part, so. We don't need to get into that, but we did do it. There was a retraction put out. Bringing that up would just highlight those facts that were already in error. Well, so. I, I think I think the the fact is, is that your your opinions uh, registered. Thank you. Okay, thank you. You don't want to talk about it. No, the, I just the, the, talk about the, the, the second the second issue oh. is assuming uh, that the rate of increase was four or five or six percent, uh, either double or triple the rate of inflation. What and and other towns have uh, had either. Uh, you know, zero percent or up to two percent rate of, uh, about the rate of inflation. What is the town doing to control expenditures so that the rate of in, the rate of increase in ta property taxes tracks the rate of inflation? So, as I sort of alluded to earlier, um, town FTEs are actually on a downward trajectory. Um, my budget, the town portion of the budget, and we could talk about the board of education budget all day, but that's. A, a, I have limited control of that. I have some courtesy responsibility, but they don't have to listen to me. They primarily listen to the Board of Finance, but the Board of Finance cannot line item control that budget, and that's 80% of our budget. Our budget had two main drivers. The first one was we've been talking about pensions in the state all along. There are two shoes that drop there, okay? People don't realize that. One of them is this teacher pension thing, which is a, 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 a shoe that we dodged this year, but the second one is some, it has to do with the municipal employee uh, pension system, a uh, retirement system, which is called MERS. We were entered into MERS a number of years ago, and it's almost impossible to get out. In order to get out of that system, we would have to basically pay off all the existing plans and have, offer substantially the exact same plan, and that's the regulations they have around it. They changed the return assumptions on MERS from 8% down to 7%. What that means for anybody who understands these, 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 these payment pools is that um, that money had to be made up somewhere. Basically, until this year, and the legislature has actually changed this for the, for the better, employees were putting in, I think, two and, a, two and a quarter, two and a half percent into that. So when you change the return assumptions down, the town had to make up that difference. That difference was $177,000 a year to the town for the next five years. That 177,000, every 130 something thousand is 1% on the town budget line. The other part of my budget that was an actual increase was contractual two and a half to two and a quarter percent increases so that our employees, uh, we could attract uh, competitive employees and we, we could have them, their benefits keep up with cost of living. And even if we didn't want to do it, we could go to arbitration and, or, or, or mediation and lose that in a battle with unions if we didn't give that to them. So basically that's fixed and net those two things out, our budget frankly would have been down. That said, there are issues with the Board of Ed and their spending, and anybody who's watched the budget discussions, we are well aware of that. Um, the Board of Ed is well aware of that, and we are in ongoing discussions right now to hopefully move forward with some plans to look at a space optimization study that will include not just some of the preliminary work that the Board of Ed did, but then fold it in with some of the stuff that the town does and see if we can more, more reasonably utilize all our facilities and potentially have uh, large-scale capital, and hopefully long-term operational savings. Those are the two big ways to do it. The other thing to do to, to control taxes is the stuff we've been talking about the whole time. There's another input, which is the grand list. The grand list has been growing at about 0.6% a year. If the grand list were growing at 3% a year, like some of these other towns, because they have amenities and, and, and other things that people want, um, 
it helps absorb some of those tax increases. So that said, it's a multi-pronged approach. You know, some of it has to do with working on their side. From our side, we continue to look. We brought in, again, $4.5 million savings over the next 20 plus years in virtual net metering savings. We brought in $500,000 in the last two years from uh, uh, bond refundings. Um, we did a tax sale to recoup money from people who weren't paying taxes. Most of those people actually converted over as opposed to us having to sell, it, sell their houses. So that, that's coming in again. We're looking under every rock and getting grants in every possible place we can. So that's what we're doing. Okay, uh, quick, thank quick, you. Quick question. What? Quick, quick, quick question. You, you mentioned um, amenities. Is there any evidence, can you cite any evidence, that lack of amenities is causing lack of uh, demand on, uh, for houses in Weston? It, 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 that, that is one input, and we've heard that from tons of real estate brokers. I met with one yesterday and one the day before who told me that. The other thing is the amenities are not just to, drive, to get people in here, but to get them to stay. So what we hear from people and what we saw in our survey is the number one driver of, of, of people staying here, people have positive ratings of the town, and people tolerating higher levels of taxes is a sense of community. The sense of community comes from people interacting each other, which can necessarily only happen when people are engaged in places where they are interacting with each other, which is amenities. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. You know, I'd, I'd like to respond to that question. Go ahead, Stephen. Um, as, you know, as Chris said, the, uh, the budget is 80% the uh, uh, Board of Education, and we have very, very limited uh, opportunities to respond to it. We essentially either recommend or don't recommend Board of Finance uh, either passes or doesn't pass or suggests cuts. Um, the, uh, one of the things that surprised me at, at, on the Board of Selectmen is that the, uh, the budget process for the Board of Education is that the uh, Selectmen and his staff essentially create a, uh, a binder uh, that includes the budget and whatever backup is in that binder is the backup that we get. Yet at a few weeks um, after the election and before the, uh, the budget has to be passed. Um, and as a result of having little transparency in that process, uh, we don't really, all we can do is nibble at the edges of a 50 plus million budget. And so we wind up arguing about $10,000 line items, $100,000 line items, nothing of real consequence. Now I want to be clear that I am not blaming the superintendent. Uh, there are FOIA limitations that prevent him from speaking to us more, more openly, statutory privacy issues that prevent him from speaking to us more openly. Um, and uh, public meeting requirements that prevent him from speaking to us more openly. Also, there have been superintendents in the region that have been fired for suggesting cuts. So we have to kind of know the procedure that we're stepping into and, and try to uh, mitigate it, try to respond to it properly. What I'd like to see happen, or at least what I'd like to see discussed, uh, is to have a consultant, a third party consultant come in uh, in the budget process, review the Board of Education budget and the town budget as well, and see if uh, with somebody who has the perspective of other communities in our area and, and otherwise and, and has seen uh, budget cuts that work and don't work, give us a report on what in that 50 million plus budget can be potentially cut. Okay, thank you very much. And next question. I just want to say thank you for doing this and hosting this. Um, Andrew Palladino, I'm on Good Hill Road. Uh, full disclosure, I'm on, also on the Marketing Communications Committee. Um, this is a follow-up to David's, David's question and Stefan's comments about town meetings, flawed as they may be, um, and special interest groups sort of dominating in certain meetings and people not showing up. So I understand the process of what committees do in this town. Can you give a brief, and if this is hard for you, Chris, I understand, because brief. Um, what do committees, <laughs> who do the committees serve? They're a smaller group of people, and when you say 30 people make the decisions of the town, who do these committees serve, and how are they chosen, and what recourse does the select Board of Selectmen have with these committees? So there's two different classes of boards, commissions and committees in town. One are elected boards, and those are chosen by you folks. It's, it's chosen by, by election. Uh, we were chosen by election. Um, then there are appointed committees. The appointed committees are appointed in a, a, a staggered means over time by the Board of Selectmen. They are, some of them have different jurisdictional guidelines, um, but they don't answer necessarily to the electorate. So you're correct there. They, they are primarily answerable to either a state organization that they report to who just has sort of broad 
guidelines and, 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 and statutory requirements for them, but in the end, they also answer to the people who appoint them, which is the Board of Selectmen. <coughs> um, we do talk to them all the time. We have multiple meetings when you know, we see stuff going on. We go in, we talk to them. We have members come up. I constantly talk with chairs. Um, but since they are basically uh, creations of the Board of Selectmen in the charter, there are ways that if, if things go completely sideways, for the selectmen to remedy, the, remedy uh, any, any potential problems there. And as we have the ability to point, we have the ability to remove. It's a little more complicated, and, and there are specific requirements in there, but, but they exist. Um, you know, so far, you know, historically, it, it's been a, a, a rarely used procedure, but it exists. Yeah, if I can comment on that as sure. well. The, uh -huh. um, uh, in both the elected positions and the appointed positions, state statute requires that we have just a bare majority of one party on each of them. So if a, if a commission is made up of seven members, four of them can only, only four of them can be of one political party. The rest have to be uh, representative of unaffiliated or the other party. So, um, you know, we have fantastic volunteers in every commission, in every appointed body. Um, but clearly, um, you know, in many cases, you only have to sign up in order to be appointed. So I'd say put pressure on your political parties. They're the ones who uh, present these people to us for appointment. And they're the ones who decide who's going to run uh, for appointment and for election in every, uh, in every case. So we have 10,000 residents in town. Uh, there's tremendous amounts of uh, volunteerism and also competence uh, and balance and objectivity in our town. And we need to have those people present themselves uh, for appointment and for election. Samantha? Um, I want to say something quickly about that. I'll be very brief. Um, one, of the th one of the items that I think we have to address is that newer people to town, I mean, I've been here 12 years, so I consider myself new, um, don't necessarily know how to become involved. And um, what I noticed um, being on the board of selectmen and interacting with the different um, committees and commissions is that there are some folks that have been on the commissions for decades. And um, just because someone's been on a commission for a decade, or just because somebody has always been there, or just because something has always been the way it's been, doesn't mean that anyone is not welcome to step up. And I think that's what's really important. Everybody's terms are up at a certain period of time. Uh, it could be two years, it could be four years, it could be six years. Um, and I think that just because somebody has been in the same spot for 30 years, 20 years, 10 years, doesn't mean that there's no opportunity for you. Um, and that's something that we've been found, finding is that people just need to be asked. They just need to be told, we want your input and we want you to volunteer. Um, and we may need, you know, the telephone, you know, the party line for everybody in here to tell five of your friends and have those five friends tell their five friends that we welcome your input and we want people to step up and, and participate. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Next question. Hi, I'm Steve Ezzies, <clears throat> excuse me, 244 Georgetown Road. And? Uh, I'm also the chairman of the Board of Finance. Thank you. Um, so, um, <laughs> full disclosure. <laughs> full disclosure. But so before I ask my question, which is a follow-on question to yours, sir, um, w w one thing I would like to say is, is our selectmen are supported by uh, Jonathan Luis, who is the town administrator. And Jonathan um, is truly a great find for, uh, for Weston. So a lot of the amenities that we're talking about which are coming at virtually no cost to the town, were discovered by Jonathan. So the sidewalk project was discovered by Jonathan. Uh, the virtual net metering project could have died a thousand deaths. It was brought to me by a former colleague of mine when I was on the Westport Board of Finance, and whose name is Jeff Mayer, who gratuitously offered us to the town. There was pushback. Uh, Jonathan and Chris moved it forward, and over time we're going to save four and a half million dollars, that's not inconsequential. Um, and there's other things that Jonathan has found with lighting. So um, I think everyone should know there are people that sit in town hall who, have, who are doing just a tremendous job to support, to support all of us. Um, my, my question, my, my, my question actually has to do with the 
uh, proposed addition uh, to the library. If in the oft and mistaken chance that the Historic District Commission turns it down, what is the next step? There might not be one. So um, it's been communicated to us and this process has been going on for two years. A lot of it hasn't been public because we've been doing a lot of backroom stuff, but um, the executor of the donor's will, who's the best friend of his, the gentleman's named Dan Offit, he lived in town, he was a fantastic artist and, and had very deep roots and connections to the town and the library and historic society and EMS and other things, um, came to us with an offer to do this. And we've been working on ways to do it, and there's been a lot of legalities and design issues and wiggling our way through figuring out the process to get it done. Um, they looked at other sites, but there, there were planning and zo there were zoning issues in that. Um, but he's giving us a $5 million gift, and the gift is, is again, the building that he thinks would represent his friends. So there's, there's some flexibility in there, but not a lot. But that's what he wants to do. He's, it's been expressed to me through, through, through the architect who works with him that, you know, he wants to give a huge gift, and it's not just $5 million. I'll tell you, it's, there's other stuff he's done and, and, and potentially could consider doing. Um, probably, I, I don't want to characterize it, but let's just say it's, it's, it's not just $5 million, it's significantly more. Um, he, he I, 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 during that meeting, it looked like it wasn't going well, so I, I met with the architect in the middle of the meeting, and I said, hey, maybe we should, you know, withdraw our, our application and, you know, come back and start, there's a 65-day consideration process in there, start it again, and she said, I don't think he's going to go for that, he's done, he, he might walk or he probably will walk. So basically, October 16th could be the end of discussing this project altogether and, and any others that are potentially in the pipeline. So I, I don't know if that answers the question. No, it doesn't answer the question. So, um, so uh, unfortunately, that's n not an answer that's acceptable. So, so let's assume it's turned down by the Historic District Commission. Is there... I don't know the town charter, I should know it, but I don't know it well enough. Is there a procedure that we can overturn by a town vote, uh, whatever the decision is by the Historic District Commission? If we had a petition and we wanted to bring I, I it to a vote. I will look into that. I know we can sue, but that would be a multi-month multi, multi -month process to, to do it. Um, whether there's a provision in, in, the, in the town charter. So the town charter or the selectmen can call a vote for any, any specific thing. However, with historic district, because this is in historic district, and I'm not an expert in that, they have specific uh, purview over. Uh, no, I understand that, I understand that Chris. Is there, is there a procedure if they were to make a decision that the town <laughs> doesn't agree with, that the town can make the decision on its own without, regardless of what the Historic District Commission decides. The, the, the only follow-up sort of mechanism we have where the town could, could basically have uh, veto power over that would be to uh, deal with the membership of the actual... So we could be called a Historic District Commission if the selectmen chose to do that? It, 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 there's section, I believe, 8.5 in the charter that gives us the ability to do that. That said, um, any individual member would have to have uh, a vote from a person of their party in order to do that. So, okay. No, I just yeah. would like to make sure that something as important as this isn't... To, my board gets reviewed not only, it's, not only by the ballot, uh, but certainly by the ATBM and the referendum. And so... Uh, you know, I get questioned, and my board gets questioned all the time. I, I think something as important as this, if by chance it does not pass through the Historic District Commission, we should review what the remedies are for that. Okay, thank well, you. That, I'm going to cut thing you on off that. on that real quick, because we have other people waiting, and I've got to move on. Okay. Okay? Thank you. All right, sorry. And we're um, after Mr... You're the next two questions, and that's it. Woody, sorry, you had your shot. i got to cut you off. So I just have one question. Go ahead, Terry. So I'm Jesse Pesquale, Pheasant Hill Road. And? Um, my question, excuse and, me? And? And I'm on the Board of Police Commissioners. Thank you. 
Uh, my question involves the onion barn and the land surrounding the onion barn. It seems to be in a bit of disrepair, and I think we all get used to it, passing in and out of town, and sometimes like clutter around your house, you just don't notice it anymore. Samantha mentioned it, and I'd like to hear um, if you have plans and if you could expand on those plans to maybe connect it to the town green, connect it to the schools, and make it more of a gathering place for people in Weston and beautify that area. Interesting you, you should ask Funny that question. you should say that, Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jess, we, we have been looking, <laughs> we we have been looking at exactly that. Uh, we've, uh, we have uh, been kind of planning a, uh, to take care of the deferred maintenance around the Onion Barn and make it a more attractive place. And as you know, I mean, my own feeling is that, as I said before, we drive into town, the gateway of town, and we've stopped seeing some of the stuff that, uh, that we should look at more carefully. The Onion Barn is one of those issues. Um, there's, uh, you know, huge puddles form on it. It's essentially a, a dirt parking lot. Uh, there's a, a very unattractive, overgrown fringe between that property and the athletic fields. And none of that has to be the case. Um, so we've been looking at removing the, uh, the s pile of stones that essentially uh, separates the athletic fields from that area, uh, putting down some stone, uh, putting in some, some more formalized uh, understanding of where the parking is supposed to be, and, and maybe very importantly, putting in a ramp that the fire department could potentially use if its access out of that parking lot is, uh, is disturbed. So that is ongoing. We would expect to have some visible work started this year. We have engineering designs on how to it, it currently remediate the water issues. We just need to do some further studies, and we'll have to do a capital allocation for the next year. So please come out and support that line item. Um, that said, you also mentioned uh, uh, connection. Yes. Uh, to the town I'm, green. I, I alluded to earlier, we have three different sidewalk grants, one for 400000 one for $1.8 million, and another one that people haven't really heard about yet because it's dependent on... Uh, the feds passing a, a uh, transportation bill, but in, in the event they do, we've got another two and a half million dollars. So potentially four and a half million, four point seven million dollars worth of uh, grants. Those are going to run sidewalks from the schools, some form around going past uh, commercial center and around out in around connecting up here, both to, to Norfield and to St. Francis down here. It, it, the spurs go out other places, but in terms of downtown. So that will be designed to interconnect these areas with, with the input of some uh, Milone and McBroom who've worked on the plan of conservation development and sort of the initiative Stefan's leaving. So it, it's, it should be in pretty good shape in hopefully the nearest future. Okay. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank and you. thank you for helping our town move forward. Trying. Moving along, let's, thank you. Um, hi, Namuk Cho, Walnut Lane. I had a quick question. Uh, my understanding is Connecticut state law states that a town cannot make the school budget less than the previous year's budget. Is that correct? Unless there's some kind of percentage drop, and I don't know this for sure, it's the minimum oh, budget enrollment. Of, of enrollment, yes. And, okay. and even then, uh, the Board of Finance is restricted to the amount that they could reduce it even if, if it goes up. So really, in realistic terms, the only thing we can control is the growth rate of the budget, of the, of the school budget. That's really all you can control. You can't necessarily cut the budget by two million bucks versus last year's. No. Right. Okay. So it's about cost control for the schools. It, it's about, yes. yes. It's about cost control. It's about optimization. It's about right. looking at novel ways of doing things. It's about understanding the trajectories and understanding the cost centers. And you, you know what some of those cost centers yeah. are. And some of them are statutorily restrictive because of the, the way sort of right. uh, laws work. So. Right. And then just a quick word of um, you know, kudos for everyone involved in the town. I think a lot of the challenges we face is macro. I, I, you know, it's very little under our control. And I think in general, the people in town, including you guys, I think people do the best they can to, to make things you know, as good as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Harvey, I see you standing back there. I'm an softy. Come on up. <laughs> Harvey. As an esteemed member of the community. It speak, Harvey. You know, Harvey Bellin, I live on Maple Street, which is the recipient of all of the bad stuff that uh, Eversource is doing above us that nobody knows about. I'll get that in a second. I want to compliment you guys. We have, we've, we're, we normally have good 
boards of selectmen. You guys are a really good balanced group. I think you're smart. I think you don't have, you're not doing it by party. I think there's some issues like, you know, the dog park, for example. No matter what you do, somebody's going to hate you, and we all know that. Um, I just wanted to comp, uh, this is based on some discussions I've had with some of you and other uh, appointed and elected officials. Arguing about policy, even saying, well, you're stupid, that won't work, is fine. We don't do that anymore in our culture. We don't attack policy, we attack people. And that's get to be really bad. Um, I've spoken to Chris and some others. Um, I spoke to people on the state who are on state uh, boards. Um, I've spoken to people on other boards. We need to stand up to our fellow citizens who attack people, not policy, because it's going to really ruin things. It's going to discourage people from attending. A uh, quick question to the room, because these are the 30 people who know everything. <laughs> How many of you know what's going on? The road that is being built without any oversight in the northwest corner of Weston by Seattle, by I'm sorry, by Eversource. Please give a show of hands. Okay. Thank you. Okay. You can uh, take that offline with Mr. Fela yeah, if you would yeah, like. Yeah, I, I will. I will put some stuff up, but but it's it's pretty interesting that nobody knows about it. The final word is that. I talked to the state of Connecticut. Our boards and commissions do have authority to look into it. And uh, we've already had So some we have a site visit with Eversource representatives, town engineer, uh, public safety people. I actually have been to the site and looked at it. We had some concerns about operation within the right of way and other stuff that you brought up, so we immediately reached out to them. They are aware of our concerns in terms of creating an attractive nuisance and other things. Um, they have agreed to come down, and we're going to have them standing there, and we're going to talk about it, you know, looking at it. Well, that might be something that... That's... Okay. It's Quickly. never sourced right away. They have a, a legal right granted through the siting council to maintain and upgrade their poles along a certain transmission pathway, and they are basically going ahead and doing that. The question is, we have some role in sort of... Uh, do or do not have some role, and it keeps going back and forth in Harvey. Where is this? The, the north of town. Old Georgetown Road. Okay. To the and um, the one amusing thing, which hopefully they'll show you, is they, they killed every living thing that they said their power line could fall on. You know what they, where their 74-foot tower is going? Next to a giant water tank from uh, Meadow Ridge. Okay, <laughs> on that okay. note. Right, well, thank, again, thank you guys. So we, we, we are following up and we yeah. are keeping the, be kept abreast the, and we'll do what we can. The but. main issue is water. Uh, I'll talk about it later. But the main yes. issue okay, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming out. I just want to make a shameless plug. Um, if you are concerned about communications in this town, the League of Women Voters of Weston will be doing a program on November 16th where we will, in this room, and we will try to figure that out. We'll have some solutions, panels of really intelligent people, myself included. No, I'm kidding. Um, but I hope you'll join us then. Um, I see you have a real quick one, sir, because, okay. I'll give you a shot just because it's, it's, you're a new you. person up in the mic. Go ahead. No worries. Um, Stefan Pfeiffer, um, Hackberry Hill Road. Um, with regards to the amenities and the plethora that we do have, um, what's the current state of the Cobbs Mill Inn? Mm. Um, <laughs> Would you like to buy it? There, there, my understanding is there's a, there's a developer interested in looking at it. They've got some designs up. They've gone through planning and zoning and had some success there. Right now, there's a consortium trying to basically raise funds. As a, as a, and again, I'm not deeply in, involved in this because I try and keep arm's length away, but my understanding is uh, it's not off the table if that matters. That's all I can say, really. That's all I know at the moment. Okay, I'd also like to bring attention to the Know Your Town directory. If you have more questions for any of these people, uh, if you look online on the town website, there's a link to it, and also about on the uh, Know Your Town, the uh, About Weston. There's a couple links to it. You can find it, and then you can complain to those people directly. You don't even have to wait for one of these events. Thank you very much to the selectmen for coming this morning.